Hello, I'm Matthew Ward and I'd like to welcome you to the Legacy of Steel book tour. We're going to do a quick reading today uh, from further into the book, so we're going to start with on chapter 8. If you want to read a little bit more, there is a uh, sample chapter upon grimdarkmagazine.com and of course the book is available now. So I'm just going to leap in and then we'll see where we get to. First night out on patrol and the sky's open, muttered Dvorad. Queen's ashes, but I get all the rotten luck. Havel pulled his cloak tighter. Dvorad was indeed blighted by poor fortune. Everyone in the second knew that because he seldom ceased complaining. Poor rations, unfaithful women, feckless comrades, medical complaints that mystified physicians. The litany went on, and would do so for some time if left uninterrupted. No one wanted that. Not Havel and not the cluster of studiously blank faces sharing the shelter of the rocky hillside. Midnight was past, the patrol done. Ten bedraggled men and women in sodden uniforms and rain-slick plate longing for the limited comforts of Artguard. Craster would have been better, but Craster lay to the east, not the west, and had been abandoned the year before Magad Andwar's attempted invasion. The watch forts weren't exactly civilization; They weren't meant to be, but their palisades kept out the wind, and their campfires held the promise of a hot meal, thin rations or not. If a body was to be stuck on the wrong side of the Ravon, with the Hadari lurking behind the eastern hills, better to be so behind walls and at garrison strength. Could be worse, Sarge, he said. And I reckon it's easing. Vorad peers suspiciously out from under the rocky overhang. You might be right. No sooner had he finished than Havel's words, spoken more in hope than truth, became prophecy. Hissing rain eased, the bright silver of moonlight broke through murky clouds. Even the wind, whose fingers had long ago pried beneath armour and rain soaked cloth, faded to nothing. And away to the west, its lights just visible through a strand of trees, the walls of Artguard. Two miles that would have been nothing but misery in the rain now seemed no distance at all. That's good enough for me. Before I straightened into some semblance of soldierly appearance. Move out. The soldiers shuffled to their feet, as glad as their sergeant to be on the move. I don't like this. Predictably, the objection came from Kalarin. If Vorad was the patrol's winger, she was its alarmist, always seeing portent in the fall of shadow or the shape of spiderweb. But then she'd been born within sight of Felhallow's eaves. Hallowsiders were strange folk. Vorad glared. No one cares what you think. Yeah, it's not right, Kalarin replied. And as she mentioned it, there was a strange smell on the breeze. Not perfume, as such, but a taste. Christmas beyond that which normally followed rain. If fond memory had a scent, it would be that. Havel shook his head. Nonsense. Like everything, Kalarin spouted. Nothing's ever right for you, growled Vorad, seemingly unaware of the irony. Think old Jack stalking out in the deep woods to make mischief? You're welcome to stay and greet him, but I'm heading back. Vorad at the fore and Havel at the rear, the patrol headed briskly out through the rising mist. No one spoke as their scattered line picked its way through the muddy moorland. Not even Vorad about his ill-fitting boots, nor Kalarin concerning the knight's ill omens. Havel was glad of the latter as the former. For all the church preached that Lemestra's light was supreme among the divine, it was hard to take solace in such promise when the sun was down. If Jack of Felhalla really was abroad that night, a prayer would be too long reaching Lemestra's ears to be worth the breath. It was therefore with some relief that Havel reached the strand of trees, halfway and with no greater ills than skin chafed by sodden cloth and flesh both hot and clammy from exertion after rain. Or at least what Havel hoped was halfway. The mist had thickened. The sparse trees were shrouded by it, dark shapes half hidden by a luminescent, vaporous grasp, as if the moon herself had reached down to embrace them. The scent of old memories was thicker than ever. I told you I didn't like this. Kalarin slid a hand beneath her tunic, fingers closing on the sun pendant she always wore against her skin. The rest of the patrol were lost in the eerie splendour of the mist, figments of fleeting shadow. All too easy to imagine shapes moving where they shouldn't. Easier still to worry about having strayed from the path. Sarge. The mist swallowed up Havel's shout as readily as it had Kalarin's complaint. Meskin? Daskarov? No answer came. Fear wormed along Havel's spine. By unspoken accord, he and Kalarin picked up their pace. Boots snagged on root and fallen bough. He'd drawn his sword even before the singing began. The notes danced through the mist, borne aloft by a chorus of women's voices, and bore in turn sharp accented words in a tongue Havel couldn't speak, but recognised from the close-fought horror of border skirmishes. Not Jack of Felhallow. Shadowthorns, he hissed. 
Calorin let go her pendant and drew her sword. Their women don't fight. That was true. At least true at the Ravon. But Havel had heard rumours that things were different elsewhere. That women had ridden at the fore of Kaiseran's invasion of the Southshires. Tales of pale witches, moonlight swords, and victories pledged to faithless Ashana, whose silver burned away sunlight. With that cold, clear hymn echoing all about, such tales were easier than ever to believe. A scream split the air. Not from ahead, where the rest of the patrol should have been, but away to Havel's right. He spun about, but the shadow-shrouded mist offered only uncertainty. We can't stay here. Karen's face was pale, her voice taut. The point of her sword twitched back and forth, challenging every shadow. Instinct told Havel to run. Duty demanded he stay. What about the others? Another cry. This one more whimper than scream. Calorin shot him a hallowed glance. Do you really want to find out, or do you? The woman did not so much step out of the mist as coalesce from within it, her close-fitting white robes dancing in harmony with the drifting vapour, and the silver traceries of her wooden half-mask writhing. A dagger of angular silver light flickered in the pale witch's hand. Calorin fell, dying hands clutching at a ragged throat. Through it all, the pale witch didn't stop singing. Havel buried to drown out the song, to drive back the fear clutching tight his chest. He held himself across Calorin's corpse, sword two-handed and swinging wild. The dagger shimmered like glass. The blow that should have beaten down the shining blade and split the wooden mask instead scraped aside. Havel staggered, balance thrown, and cried out as a cold, searing spike slipped between breastplate and pauldron to jar against bone. The woman whirled away, untouched. Blood slipped an arm suddenly numb. The sword fell away into undergrowth. Havel stumbled away. The pale witch advanced, her white robe spotted scarlet. The mist parted to a wild bellow. The pale witch's song faltered as Vorad's armoured shoulder thumped into her chest. Down they went with a crunch of breaking bone. The shard dagger skittered off the sergeant's breastplate as he kneeled above her. His sword thrust down, and the pale witch's song ceased. Shadow thorns, Vorag growled. Bloody eight shadow thorns. The mournful chorus heightened through the billowing mist. Three more pale witches coalesced, daggers wicked in their hands. Vorag's shoulders dipped, then came up straighter with the sword levelled in challenge. His eyes met Havel's. Get to our guard. Warn them. He rounded on the nearest pale witch, sword alive in his hand and defiance in his voice. Death and honour! Good arm cradling the other, Havel ran. He drove hard for where he'd last seen Artgar's walls, praying that the mist hadn't scattered all sense. He didn't look back as Vorad's scream sounded, but forged on through mist and shadow, his desperate pace a match for a ragged, thundering heart. The trees' oppressive shadow passed away to suggest clear skies overhead. Still Havel ran. The cruel, aching song faded behind, and still he ran. He stumbled at the brook, ankle turning as rushing waters clutched his boots. Muddy ground slipped away into a rain-soaked ditch. A palisade loomed dark through the mist. The shadow thorns, he shouted. The Hadari are coming! His words vanished into the mist without reply. Gasping for breath, Havel stared up at the walls, hoping for a sign he'd been heard. None came. Between the mist and the diffuse glow of firestone lanterns upon the battlements, all was opaque. The brook gave Havel his bearings. His course had run too far south. The gatehouse lay to the north. Lungs of fiery ache, he stumbled about the ditch's perimeter. The drawbridge was down, without a sentry in sight. Relief rushed cold, not a soul seen, when a dozen men should have offered challenge. Havel edged across the bridge, the crackle in his skin growing. The song might have faded to the east, but the scent of the mist remained. Memory and longing, all bound together. He passed beneath the gatehouse, leaving bloody palm print as proof of passage. Still no challenge, no voices, no bodies. The courtyard spread before him, vaporous tides ebbing and flowing about barrack house and stable. Horses champed and winded in their stalls, but there, at the base of the beacon tower, a shadow in the mist, a hint of king's blue cloak and steel armour. He wasn't alone. The Hadaria here, they... The shape shifted and fell with a clatter, not as would a body cast down or struck, but one who simply no longer wished to stand. Havel glimpsed Captain Bandar's bearded face, eyes closed and lips slack in a contented expression. Do tell... The woman who'd let Bandar fall was unlike any Havel had ever seen. She wore no robes, nor mask to conceal her wistful expression and close-cropped ash-blonde hair, only a pale shift dress worn over skin shining silver. What beauty she had was not so much cruel as disinterested, a cat waiting to unsheathe claws, but uncertain of making the effort. Which would you prefer, the dagger or the dream? It doesn't matter to me, but I'm to give you the choice. Mother insists. The mist ebbed, revealing body streamed beneath the walls. Some lay in pooling blood, weapons yet clutched in their hands. Others seemed untouched, their face beatific amid slaughter. Havel stood transfixed as the woman drew closer. 
Her left hand, which he thought empty, nursed a wicked blade. Green eyes blazed into Havel's soul. The pressure of her being stole his breath. He'd never felt so small, so insignificant. For all her slightness, the woman felt vast, as if she filled all the space between the palisade walls and more besides. He never even thought to regret the loss of his sword, because every fibre of his being screamed that she wasn't his to kill, that he'd never be worthy of offering her harm, even if steel could threaten such. Well, ephemeral? Her voice turned playful. Shall I choose for you? Would you like that? Havel's answer fell dry on a dusty mouth. Somehow he found strength to tear himself away. As he lurched for the gatehouse, the archway crowded with pale witches. Their song crashed back as if it had never left. Breaths short and shallow, he stumbled for the battlement stair. His foot caught on the uppermost step. He sprawled against the rampart, and there, among the thinning mist and moonlit field, bore witness to the Republic's doom. A great golden column approached Artguard from out of the eastern hills, serried ranks of scale armour and tower shields marching beneath banners of emerald silk and silver owl. Some led caparison horses by the bridle, others bore great axes and warhammers. The emperor's immortals, the finest warriors of a realm that birthed little else. Behind them came archers and outriders in drab leathers, spear bands and creaking wagons, thousands of men marching west beneath the cover of mist with bloody purpose in mind. And without even turning his head, Havel saw three others just like it. A hurried glance away south towards Sargard confirmed his horror. There on the open meadows a fifth column, and lying behind at the eastern hills a sixth. At the head of each, walking a dozen paces before the foremost banner, a woman of silver like the one he'd fled in the courtyard below, and in the spaces between, the alabaster robes and the mournful song of the pale witches. Three such columns could have ringed Arad tight. Six were set the east shires burning. In that stark, terrible moment, Havel was seized by certainty that what he beheld was but part of the whole. Glorious, isn't it? Havel grabbed at the wall, heart in his throat. The silver woman had reached his elbow without sight or sound to betray her approach. I don't understand Mother's reluctance. She spoke as one puzzling over a mystery. Certainly as gaudy, and crude beyond words, but the anticipation, the resolve. I'm certain it will only get better once the killing begins. The purpose returned to Havel's sluggish thoughts. The beacon. It might not penetrate the mist, but it had to be tried. Arad had to be warned. Shoving away from the palisade, Havel ran for the beacon tower's winding stair. With every step ascended, he left a piece of himself behind, trickling away with his blood. But the gold glinting in the dark drove him on, one faltering step at a time. As he reached the top, he risked a glance behind. The silver woman stood on the battlements, her expression twisted as one puzzling at another's inscrutable deeds. Did she not grasp the beacon's purpose? The oil-soaked logs waited in their geometric stack. The brazier burned close by. One last effort. With his good hand, Havel reached for a burning brand. Death and honour, he gasped. He felt a feather-like touch at his neck. The world rushed warm and red. Silver hands caught him as he fell, the embrace gentle, almost kind. Warmth faded before a creeping chill. Hush now, she breathed. Secrets are sacred. But though you chose the dagger, you shall have the dream anyway, because it pleases me. Forget this life, and let wonder carry you off. Bloody fingers brushed Havel's brow. When they withdrew, they took with them pain, cold, fear, sight, all sensations save one. For that last, longest heartbeat, he knew nothing but joy. There we go, chapter 8 of Legacy of Steel. I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, please do check in with the, the other stops on the blog tour. There are some interviews. There's another reading. Uh, as I said before, there's a chapter extract available on grimdarkmagazine.com. Um, and it's available now. Hardback in the UK. Uh, paperback in the US, which is what I've been reading from today. And, of course, uh, digital copies the world over. So thanks for coming. And uh, I'll see you next time.